everyone. Today's video is inspired by the Dofer A155. It's an analog eight step sequencer and it can do all kinds of things and it's a really creative sequencer. And I say that this video is inspired by it because although I am gonna talk about this sequencer and show you some things it can do, this video is really more about a history of modular and sequencing in general, some thoughts about hardware in general. So I guess it's fair to say it's about the A155 within the context of modular history and modalities of sequencing. So first I'm gonna put things in a historical context and talk about modular and how the A100 system came out. Then I'm gonna talk about some ideas and things that I've been thinking about when I think about sequencers, think about modules, and think about making music. And then after all that, I'm gonna hook it up to the rack behind me and walk you through a patch that I think shows it off and shows off some of its features. At the end, I'm gonna talk specifically about the A155 and some, maybe some pros and cons for putting it in your setup. Before I dive into history and my thoughts and everything, if you like this type of content, please make sure to subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And that way you can get notified whenever I put out a new video. Synthesizers have been around for a long time and modular synths have been developed since the 50s. And we all know that Bob Moog and Buchla were doing their things in the 60s, but into the 70s and 80s, modular sort of became more of like a specialized niche. But modular never really went away. And in the 90s, there was a resurgence starting to bubble up. In the mid 90s, Dieter Dofer introduced the A100 modular synthesizer system. It was a collection of 10 modules into a specific sized rack with specific power requirements. And slowly, over the next few years, that became a standard for other manufacturers to follow, so that way there could be modules working together and intertwined together from all kinds of different makers. You could mix and match modules to make your own unique setup and your own unique system. Modular, you're a rack, it's what we all know and love. So thank you, Mr. Dofer, for that. We really appreciate it. So while there's still other formats out there, your rack is definitely taken hold as one of the most popular. There's hundreds of makers in the space and even some larger companies. Dofer has continued to innovate and come out with new modules year after year. Now it has over a hundred. One of those was the A155. It came out in January of 2004. So we're approaching its 20 year birthday. In Eurorack years, this thing is ancient. Now I'm not sure if it's the first Eurorack sequencer, but I think it's old enough and near the beginning enough that I can call it an OG classic analog modular synth. So I'm stating all this history because I think putting a little bit of context around this demonstration and talking about the A155 really matters. Since the beginning, we've had a ton of innovative makers putting out really amazing and creative modules. Make Noise, Mutable Instruments, IntelliGel, ALM Busy Circuits, and I mean, I could go on and on and on. There are also really small boutique makers, and then of course, a whole DIY community building their own modules and kits out there and everything else. So there are a lot of options, and what you choose matters a lot. So this channel is all about hardware synths with a particular focus around my modular journey and expansion. I started playing music, playing the piano, and I play a lot of other instruments. I gig a lot playing guitar, I can play the banjo, I play trombone in a jazz band, and much of my synthesizer music over the past 15 years has been on soft synths working in the box, composing music. So I'm very comfortable working in a DAW. In fact, I oftentimes working in a DAW to be more efficient and easier to kind of compose in a traditional format. Oftentimes when I look at hardware, one of the questions that goes into my mind is, what does this offer me that I can't get inside my laptop? I don't wanna go down the hardware versus software rabbit hole. That's not what this video is about. But the point I'm making is that modular in particular does offer me something that I can't get in a DAW. Or at least it makes a way of making music that I can't do as effectively or efficiently in a DAW. 
even though I probably technically could. By using my modular system, I find that I go to creative areas and explorations that I would never get to if I was working solely in a DAW. And additionally, just closing my laptop, shutting down my computer, and getting lost in a creative space is something that I find modular lends itself really well to. I can relax while I'm playing. And in a way that I will never get when I'm looking at a computer and working in the box. So why does that matter? If I was composing a song on a guitar, I might lean towards keys that are easily played on the guitar, maybe some open chords, things like that. If I was making a horn arrangement, I might keep the notes within a certain range so that a certain horn could play something. And another example would be um, rather than having an endless stream of eighth notes, you'd have to put rests in there because the player is going to need to breathe. So whenever you make music, you have to account for the limitations and strengths of the instrument that you're playing with. The nature of the instrument matters. The instruments influence the music that you create with them. I mentioned earlier that modular brings me to new creative places that I wouldn't be able to get in a DAW. And part of that is because of the limitations the format offers, and part of that is because of the strengths the format offers. So there are two main points that I want to highlight under this idea. One is the expression DAW in a box. We're going to talk a little bit about that. The other one is sort of different modalities of sequencing. So let's break this down a little bit. Now there's a lot of new hardware since out there that you kind of have to program or they have screens that it kind of feels like you're using a mini computer when you're using them. Maybe you have to scroll through a menu or memorize certain button combinations, something like that. Often those to me feel like a similar creative process to using a mouse to click around on a DAW and using a MIDI controller. Sequencers in particularly, I think are prone to falling into that DAW in a box area. The Korg SQ64 is a sequencer that I have and I use a lot. And oftentimes when I use it, I think to myself, why aren't I just using my laptop for this? My laptop is easier to program it does the same exact thing. I can save all my files and access them, maybe even change them to another computer really easily. And I already know how to use it and I already own it. So for this reason, I tend to gravitate towards modules that don't have screens, that don't have button combinations you have to memorize or cryptic ways to use it, many of which are all analog, which gives me something also that I can't get on my computer. Now I still have some of those modules and I think some of them are great, but in general, it's not my jam. And the reason I bring this up is because, as I said earlier, there's been many makers in the space over the past 20 years. Many of them, I already mentioned the Korg SQ64, appear to me to be getting, trying to get the functionality of a DAW crammed into a module or into a box. And I'm interpreting that as not necessarily embracing those limitations and strengths of modular that can bring us to those creative spaces, but rather trying to overcome them and circumvent them. And in some ways, I think that detracts from the experience of modular. So that brings me to my next point, which is modalities or methods of sequencing. So you don't even need a sequencer to make a melody using modular. I've experimented taking random voltages and using a sample and hole module to create and sending it through quantizers. You know, you can do all kinds of stuff to make really creative music. So to this point, adding in randomness is a big part of making music in this space. There are modules dedicated to simply adding randomness and random voltages to your system. So whether you're modulating something or sequencing something, adding a little randomness gives up some control by the musician, by the user. You also find people in modular often making self-generating patches and having the hardware actually sort of generating its own music. And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about the nature of modular systems. 
Whereas composing on a computer gives you absolute and complete control of your sound and composition. In a modular environment, you have to give up some of that control. One analogy might be taking a canoe or a rowboat down a river. While you have a certain degree of control to influence the direction of the craft, you still have to accept that you're going in one direction and there's nothing you can do about it. So if that's the kind of mode that we're working in, sequencers, in my mind, that really shine in this environment are the ones that embrace that side of modular rather than giving you more control. It's sort of a controlled chaos. And the A155 is a great example of what I'm talking about. I also have Music Thing Modulars Turing machine with a couple of expanders. That's another great example. And there are likely many, many more out there. But I think it's important to recognize or just sort of name this framework so I can talk about why I like the A155 so much. So it's all analog and you can't program in specific notes but rather use the knobs to control outputs of voltages. So you really need to understand how synthesis works to get the most out of it. Also, for better or for worse, it shines when it's used in conjunction with lots of other modules as a part of a system. So I would call it a team player. I mean, that also means that you need to own a lot of other modules, but I really like that aspect of it. When you're using it there, you have to kind of switch your brain to thinking about voltages rather than notes. And that switch highlights to me that my computer is shut down and that I'm working in a totally different environment. So I'm not trying to sell you on anything. Uh, this video isn't sponsored by Dofer. I bought this with my own money. I hope that you enjoy the patching and the music and methods that I'm gonna show you and that you're gonna see in here in a minute. But I also hope that you think about how you make music, how your system impacts the music you make and how the instrument that you've created in your modular setup is a reflection of you. So with all that said, I've got the modules set up behind me. I'm gonna put the 155 in there and demonstrate a little bit of what this thing can do. After that, I'll give some talking points about um, some pros and cons about ownership in case you were interested in buying it. All right, let's get to it. Okay, first things first, let's just go through a quick overview of what all of these things do and how they all work together. So basically, if you look at these lines of switches, there are four LEDs right here. That's trigger one goes out here, trigger two goes out here, trigger three and a gate. So these switches control which one goes out. So right now I have it going with it's not doing anything. So these this top row of, of switches, they can control whether or not trigger one or trigger two goes off. So if I set it like that, every time it passes by one, it'll trigger trigger one. And if I wanted to switch it up like that, It'd be a nice easy way to kind of like make drum beats or something like that you can um, or you can trigger envelopes there's all kinds of different ways and it allows you to kind of get creative and make it makes it very playable but like so for instance i'm going to just go ahead and send out trigger one into triggering a bass drum sound So you can mute them all, turn them back on again. All right, so let's add a synth voice. I'm gonna use my AI synthesis VCO that I built. I showed it off in a, a previous video of the cheap versus more expensive VCOs. That's what I'm gonna use today. It's right there. To get actual like voltages that you could use for sequences, there's two lines that you can use to create voltages. And there are these knobs that control it. The range is either controlled by this switch, uh, one volt, two volts, or four, four volts. And if we're talking in synthesis terms, 
that basically comes out to one octave, two octaves, or four octaves. Right below that, for this line, that gives you a little bit more functionality to choose the scale by a knob. And then right here, we have the glide functions that will be, it's a slew limiter, so it'll make it either be a smooth transition to the next voltage or not such a smooth transition. So this is how you control what notes you're playing. So I'm gonna play this for you so you can hear what it sounds like, but it's just gonna be random voltages at first. So we'll go straight into our VCO. It's just going um, unquantized. There's no envelopes or anything. I'm playing around with the glide functions and just playing around with some of the knobs. That's four octaves of range. We could turn it down a little bit. Maybe just one octave range. All right, enough of that. Let's make our voice a little bit more interesting by adding in a, an envelope. So we have a couple different choices. You have the trigger and you have the gate that you can use. Basically a trigger is gonna be just a short burst. I'm actually gonna use the trigger to trigger my sequences. The gate, what happens when you have it on gate is if, if all of these are turned down, the gate, should, it's just gonna stay high. So, um, there's more things you can do with that, but right now I'm just gonna go ahead and choose. I'm just gonna do it through triggering. So we're gonna plug into my uh, Dofer Quad ADSR. This is gonna be a Dofer heavy patch. And then we'll go from that into my Dofer Quad mixer for the, into the CV control. Okay, so I'm gonna run the sound into the mixer and I will run the voltage out of the A155 into the volts per octave. So now too, you can control when your um, sequence uh, triggers by just flipping these switches on and off. Okay, but we're still not quantized. I'm just gonna go ahead and quantize this voice. So I'm gonna take this part out and we'll send our post out. I'm gonna use an ornament in crime to do this. And we'll go in the Dorian mode. So that means I'm gonna need to multiply my trigger because we have to trigger the quantizer as well. So I'm gonna use my Dofer multiplier. Could also, I guess, use a clock out. There's all kinds of different ways to do this. That's what's fun about this stuff. I need a better cable management system. This is not working for me, but I'm gonna go ahead and use a too long cable to plug in here. And then we'll come back down to my quantum main. I just got ornament crime, mainly for use as a quantizer. Let's see what that sounds like. starting to get somewhere. Let's just make our voice a little bit more interesting. I'm going to, to modulate the uh, pulse width.
uh, let's get a little bit creative and I'm gonna create a little bit of a ratchet. And I'm gonna use the Dofer A160-5, that's a clock multiplier. And what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna send a trigger out from trigger two and we'll send it all the way up to the second line in the quad ADSR and we'll come out of that. And why don't, why don't we go ahead and use maths to kind of uh, control it and we'll send math, the sum of math into our clock multiplier. So now what's gonna happen is every time a trigger happens here, it's gonna send, it's gonna create an envelope on the quad ADSR. And math is gonna control it to choose the value of the clock multiplier. Now that also means that we need to send our clock in. So I'm gonna take it, the gate out of there, we'll put that in the clock in, and then we'll send the clock out back up to the gate. So this way, rather than doing it from here, what's gonna happen is uh, the envelope will create these ratchets, but the quantization won't be re-triggered, so we'll be giving off the same note. So let's hear what that's gonna do. some playing with to get all the voltages to line up just the way you want it but at the same time that's also where you can get super creative you can make them last longer you can have it if you're playing at a slower pace you can have it multiplied even more um, but what's great about it too is it's it's controlled by that one line of switches and so now here's one of the limitations to the to the a155 is that this is controlling not only the bass drum sound but the ratchets. And so you cannot trigger them both at the same time. Um, so that's kind of unfortunate. You would have to trigger it from different uh, triggers. And that's where, again, having two of these would probably be the best way to go. But since I don't have that, it's basically this line of switches. If I turn it down, it creates a ratchet. If I flip it back to the middle, it creates nothing. And if I turn it up, it creates a bass drum uh, sound. So. So now there's also some really creative ways to, it's an eight step sequencer, but we can actually do a whole bunch of things to make it sound like a much longer sequence. So over here on the A154, you can actually control which direction it goes in. So you can go forwards, backwards, a pendulum or random. So let's just set it to random for a second. So you can also turn it up and make it be a one shot where it just plays through once. Going backwards, pendulum. You can also set it to be controlled through CV if you wanted to have it, I don't know, some other type of control voltage controlling the direction it goes in. Um, but another fun thing you can do is use CV to change the mode. So let's just do that real quick. You could even use a, an envelope. That would be kind of cool. Why don't we do 
so an envelope, let's use another envelope from our quad ADSR. That's cool. So how am I gonna do this? So what I've got here, I've got um, just an LFO at a low frequency, the pulse output, and here I'll turn it up a little bit, um, the frequency up a little bit. That's gonna trigger my gate right here, which is gonna go up and have a nice slow decay. And so you can see right over here how what that's hap what it's doing to the sequence. Every time it triggers, it just kind of gives this stutter step. And you could actually make it a little bit slower, maybe even a slower attack. Let's see, watch this. See, and there it goes. So. course that's not clock sync but that's kind of cool it adds some kind of evolving randomness to it so another way that we can kind of make more interesting sequences that kind of evolve over time is using our bottom row of controls right here so I'm gonna come out of here and go into the post out here now as you see you got these external audio inputs so when you put something else into here like an LFO or any other type of value um, it will control um, it will change the the pitch and these knobs become attenuators for that pitch so I'm gonna go ahead and use math it's right here so let's plug in I don't know we can do something random and we'll turn on the LFO function and now here, let's make it nice and slow. Something like that. I don't know if you can see that, but you're going to hear it. So on number four, that's where um, you're going to hear the pitch of this change over time. should also add that you can also change the first and last note uh, with these so like you know so if you wanted a shorter sequencer uh, if you wanted a shorter sequence than eight notes you could do that using these just to make this a little bit more interesting, let's send this through some effects. I'm gonna put this through uh, Cumulus, which is a Mutable Instruments Clouds clone from After Later Audio. Before we even do that, let's also send it to a filter. We'll use the Popple from After Later, After Later Audio.
So that's it. That gives you a rundown. There's still so much that I still have to got to play around with to figure out. Um, there are ways you can use the sample and hold control to make longer, to make longer gates and things like that. So there's a lot to it. And I just love the kind of sciencey element of just making all of these modules work together. Um, to me, that's kind of the pleasure of modular synthesis. And I could be sitting here for hours just kind of playing around with this and um, making this integrate with the other modules. So th that's what I really like about this sequencer. I'm probably going to dive in, get another one of these, um, and just really build a larger system around it. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. I was editing the footage a little bit and I realized that I totally forgot to show that you could use the lines of voltages to actually modulate something. I was gonna hook it up to the cutoff of my filter. I forgot to do that, but that's just another kind of creative aspect to it. So here's a couple of things to think about if you are thinking about purchasing this. Um, number one, the most obvious, it's big. 50 HP, um, it, it just takes up a whole lot of space. If you have a compact setup or a smaller rack, then this probably isn't for you. For me, I'm starting to get into building racks and I don't mind having a big setup. In fact, I'm appreciating larger modules more because I find the compact nano ones just kind of too difficult to use or not as fun to use or something. So for me, I don't really necessarily care that this is that big. I think without the added A154 sequencer controller, uh, it's pretty bare bones. So those two together, it starts to get more, it starts to get pricey. In fact, I think I'm gonna add another one to my system. So right there, that's just much more than most other sequences on the market. That to me is the biggest reason why you wouldn't wanna go down this route. You can get a Metropolix or some other type of sequencer for a few hundred bucks and this one you're probably looking at spending much more. With that said, I think this thing's awesome. I'm totally digging it. Um, I really wanna buy another one and then ideally I would like to even have another one um, set up. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to afford that but maybe over time I might invest in that. It's so creative and freeing and I just, really, really, truly enjoy it. I personally love the fact, love, love, love that there's no screens and that you can just sit down and improvise on this thing and with absolutely no programming at all. So I think that is perfect. That is exactly the way that I wanna make music. That's exactly the way that I want my modular system set up. So this, this sequencer is perfect for my personality and taste and workflow that I like working in modular. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.